Next, from Chicago, we attend the City Club of Chicago panel discussion of Chicago Tribune reporters as they discuss the story they broke of sexual abuse taking place in Chicago public schools. This runs about 45 minutes. Thank you so much uh, to the City Club for having us here today. Um, before we talk about this investigation uh, with the reporters, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about Betrayed for those of you who may have forgotten about it or may not have read it in the first place. In June, we launched this series, and these four reporters, two uh, veteran investigative reporters, our top data specialist at the Tribune and our CPS reporter, uh, spent more than six months digging into the issue of student abuse at Chicago Public Schools. We produced 12 stories that we launched online that day and then rolled out into print in the days that followed. And what, what happened afterward, what really stunned the city. Um, we found, we reported that adults at CPS were preying on students and little was being done to address that problem or punish the perpetrators. CPS, in fact, had never revealed the extent of the problem didn't even seem to be tracking it. So we did, using police records, court documents, other documents and records, interviews, these reporters made it clear that children weren't being protected, that there have been hundreds of victims and that those victims have been betrayed by a system where educators didn't believe them, where investigations were botched, where background checks were botched, and where educators looked the other way. Uh, the evidence of harm was so convincing and the fallout so powerful that CPS now is promising sweeping changes to protect the children. School CEO Janice Jackson has said that the revelations made her sick to her stomach and she would not rest until she knew the district was adequately protecting its students. We will have more stories to write in the uh, weeks, days, and months to follow. There's more for us to examine. We rarely stop. We don't stop. Um, we will be keeping track of whether CPS and Jackson and the Emanuel administration can actually follow through on those promises, and uh, these, these reporters will be a big part of that effort. These were the four bylines you saw on the stories, these very powerful stories. Um, but I would like to say if you go to the website, you will see that there are almost 20 people who contributed to this project. Everybody from photographers to our video staff, social media, um, digital presentation. Um, there were three editors on this project. I was one of them, obviously. Um, my deputy played a key role in getting these stories ready for print and making them as powerful as they are. She's here today, Karen Tissue. Put a big role in this. So let me um, quickly introduce the reporters. You see um, David Jackson at the far end. Uh, um, Gary Marks. Um, David and Gary uh, have worked together as a team for quite a while now. They're um, the Woodward and Bernstein of uh, Chicago. Um, they mentioned uh, prize winning um, projects earlier. They're a big part of that. Uh, several of those uh, projects I'm sure you're familiar with uh, have made a big impact on this city and on this country. Um, Juan Perez, Johnny, is our CPS reporter. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him on this project and to be able to work with the, the Metro Department as far as um, editing and reporting the series. And then closest to me, Jennifer Smith Richards, just a fabulous reporter and also our best um, specialist in data reporting at the Chicago Tribune. So what I'll do here is uh, ask some questions that you all throw up here for me, and I have a few of my own. Um, why don't we just start at the beginning, in a way, though, uh, David. Um, we often begin an investigation with a tip, with a very general idea, and then the reporting takes us someplace unexpected. Tell us a little bit how the reporting on Betrayed began and then how it evolved. Thank you so much, and thank you guys for your questions. We're really, really grateful. This uh, project began, essentially, reports trickle into the newsroom, and, and you see them on your TV screens all the time of a disgraced editor uh, disgraced uh, educator who's taken advantage of a student. <laughs> 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 
I, I'll be leaving from here and going directly home. <laughs> you guys have the blue slips. I'm going to be getting the pink slip. <laughs> it's a little color coordination thing. Uh, no, we, we uh, seriously, uh, uh, the Tribune runs stories all the time of, of educators who abuse kids, and the, we cover the bond hearing, and then I guess essentially the Klieg lights sort of turn off, and we don't follow up, well, what happened next, and how often does this happen, and why does this happen? We sort of treat it as uh, this uh, monstrous person did a terrible thing. It was a, a one-off, thank God they caught that person. And we decided as a team to step back and take a really hard look at um, how this happens and how often it happens. And essentially, uh, what really made it an investigative project was when we turned to the Chicago Public Schools for information, we hit a stone wall of silence. And uh, they wouldn't uh, give us any da data. They wouldn't provide information about any of the cases that we asked about. And so we had to really turn to other sources to dig out the truth. And um, ultimately, as George suggested, uh, we found, uh, uncovered, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 523 Chicago police reports during the last decade in which a student had been sexually assaulted or abused in a school. And that was just a shocking uh, number for all of us. I think if you'd asked us at the outset what we expected, I think we would have said, well, we'll find dozens of cases maybe, but none of us expected to find hundreds of cases. So I want to uh, thank one of the audience members, Vivian Lee, here for a question that uh, touches on what David was just talking about, but also summarizes in a very pithy way that I appreciate, uh, much better than my question, which I think was three sentences and and uh, four lines long. Um, I'm gonna direct it at Jennifer here who did it, dealt a lot with our freedom of information requests. Her, uh, Vivian's question is, how much did CPS obstruct your investigation? Very pithy, as I said. A great deal. Um, we filed several freedom of information requests. At the beginning, just to find out if we could put a number on how often this was happening. Then also to try to get you know, sort of detailed information about individual cases that we had come across through other sources. Um, CPS was largely not responsive to our requests until we threatened to sue them. And then slowly information started to come out. Yeah, I would add that um, one, one of the things I've noticed in my time uh, at the Chicago Tribune um, is this commitment that we've seen um, from Bruce Dold, our editor, and for him, Jerry Kern, uh, to fight these FOI battles, to enlist our lawyers, to list, enlist outside legal counsel. Uh, as you can imagine, none of that is cheap, even if you're not actually going to court, even if you're writing letters uh, that indicate that we're owed these documents. Um, it takes a commitment, really, from the newsroom on the top of the newsroom in order to uh, shake loose these documents and make, make it clear that we're not going away. I mean, I think you've seen that uh, with our coverage of the, uh, the uh, property tax assessments in Cook County. Uh, we took Joseph Berrios and the county to court, and we've won at every level, and um, they did not stop us from writing that story. And in this case, um, we were able to shake loose enough documents uh, to continue our reporting. Of course, we would not have stopped anyway, but um, what, uh, from the, the documentation, what was the, the key moment there, do you feel? So this is happening over a series of months. We started requesting in uh, January of this year and started getting information back right around May. Uh, I think there was a moment when, when CPS did finally release some data to us that counted their own incident reports for how many times um, a, a school employee had been accused of abuse or assault of a student. And that number was 430. So that moment where they explained to us that yes, we, we, have, we admit that we've conducted this many investigations and it, it so closely mirrored what we had found through other sources um, was a stunning and you know, devastating moment for us. So we wanted um, 
to build the story, obviously, around the documents that we could get, around the, the data and the facts. Um, but we knew it, at the heart the story was about um, people, about children, vulnerable children, um, who deserved better. Uh, to get at that and to write that in a way that really was true to what they experienced, we needed to talk to those um, young people and to their families. Gary, all of you did some of this. Gary, you were part of that effort. How do you go about that type of sensitive reporting? Well, um, actually, my nickname is the human battering ram. <laughs> but I did the exact opposite in this case. So um, I'm going to talk about Tamara Reed, who is up there. She was sort of the lead person um, in the story. And you know, th these are the most sensitive interviews, really, you can do as a reporter. Um, uh, Tamara has uh, just finished her junior year in high school, so she is still a minor. Um, she is obviously very young, so I did not approach her directly. You approach her guardian or her parent, you go through them first. And, um, and that's what I did. I went to Lynette, who is her mother, and I explained to her very clearly what, our, uh, what we were reporting about um, and why we wanted to speak to her and her daughter. And we, in, in cases like this, when you're dealing with a minor and you're dealing with issues of sexual abuse and things like that, we, you know, all the power is in the hands of the individual. It's in the hands of the parent and it's in the hands of Tamara. And that's something we explain very clearly. I don't know the perception that people have of journalists. You go in there and you just knock on doors and you quickly write down quotes. It's actually the exact opposite of that. You tell them, and I told Tamara and her mother, I said, you know, this is your story. This is your opportunity. This is what we're writing about. It's completely up to you to do that. And so, um, and if you want to be on background, as we'll call it, and that is, you just want to tell your story. We're not going to say we, we spoke to you at all. Um, and we'll just, you know, it's just for our information. It'll educate my reporting on the topic. Um, that's fine. If you want to be quoted, but not by name, that's also your option. If you want to be quoted by name, that's your option as well. If you want to be quoted by name and have your picture on the front page of the newspaper and a video that's put on the website for everybody to see, that's your option also. Again, these are not choices that we as journalists make. These are choices that the minor makes with her guardian and with her parent. So I sat down first with, um, with Lynette and with Tamara um, you know, in their small, uh, you know, kitchen table, and again, explained to them what we were doing and, and said, you know, let's talk. Tell me your story if you want to. You don't have to decide now which options you want to choose, whether you want to be on the record or off the record. You make that decision. And it's up until the date of, of publication, you can rescind that. And David and I, this has happened to us numerous mm -hmm. times. We can be working on a story for three or four or five months, we have a 4,000 word profile written about somebody and they call us the day before publication or a week before and say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this because they're a minor, because it involves a very sensitive subject and we don't publish that story. So in this case, I met with them at least three or four times, reviewed the materials and in the end they decided to be on the record and again, to be photographed with a video and, um, you know, it, it's not our courage, it's not our determination that really makes this kind of peace. It's individuals like Tamara who, even though she's only 17 now, was able to speak up in front of the entire world and tell her story about being pursued by a teacher in a very, very uncomfortable, embarrassing, and damaging way. And so she's the one who deserves the credit, uh, not us really as reporters. So, Gary, this is actually you're answering answer my question, but also was brought up here by Julia uh, Stralo of the Chicago Children's Advocacy Center, who has about this whole process. Yeah. Uh, she also asked, I think, a really important question here: Do you follow up to see how they're doing after they tell their story? Absolutely. Um, we do that. I, I talked to her the day after the story went online. I spoke to her mother. Um, I asked, you know, obviously, how was she doing at school because she's. She, is a, she was a junior at uh, Chicago Public High School. Um, and, and so yes, I, we followed up numerous times with them. And she actually decided to appear at the uh, legislative hearing several weeks later. So, you know, stories like this can become very empowering. And for somebody like Tamara, 
it was incredibly empowering for her to be able to speak up, to become the face of this series, and to hopefully help other young people in the future. And that's what the best journalism, I think, can do. We offer a platform to those like her. Yeah, I think one of the things that we uh, pride ourselves on in our approach at the Chicago Tribune in our investigations is transparency. So in this case, in dealing with uh, these young people, they knew what we were up to, and they knew that they were going to perhaps be on the front page of the newspaper. They knew what they were going to be uh, quoted about, and they, they, there was going to be no, there were going to be no surprises. We're, we, we rarely, in our investigations, do you ever see an anonymous quote, an anonymous source. Uh, we get people on the record. We rely on those on the record interviews, documentation. And similarly, with the people we write about, the institutions we write about, we let them know what's coming to. We want their side. We want to hear what they have to say. That came up in two different ways with this series. I'm wondering, Johnny, if you could talk a little bit about our interactions with CPS, which was a very involved sort of dance. And, and this goes, and yeah, and it's a dance that comes on top of the battles that we were having with uh, the Freedom of Information Act battle that, uh, that we were, or continue to fight with the district. Um, I will say that uh, our reporting process certainly reached a point at which we had to make a decision as to whether or not, and what, rather when we were going to come to the district and show them what we had found and uh, ask formally for their responses to that. How many memos did we end up assembling, at least in this first outside? I want to say 10, at least just memo length series, a memo length series of, of findings and questions, uh, asking for a response on this, laying out the summary of uh, what it was our finding are, findings were that prompted this. Um, and I got to say, you know, it's, it's, it was an incredible moment when, you know, you have these phone conversations and you let them know this stuff is coming and you try to sort of open kind of a back channel to having these sorts of communications and, and then the moment when the responses arrive, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of a 25 page memo, just a series of, of answers and responses to the questions that we had posed where that was certainly a major moment for, for me and I think for the rest of us too when, when it really, the magnitude of what it was we were trying to do and the response that we had spurred really began to hit home for a lot of us. Um, that's not, that's not for a beat reporter, that's, you're normally not in that kind of a situation, right? It's normally a little bit more of a fluid process. It's rarely, rarely are there instances in which you're kind of sitting down and having formal interviews. And, you know, it's, it's often much, a much faster paced thing sometimes when you're trying to fill the paper on a daily basis. Um, but in this case, we were very transparent with the district about what it was we were doing and how we had arrived at our conclusions and what it was we were going to say. And, um, you know, to the district's credit, at least in this case, I think they were pretty transparent with us as well as about the reforms that it, they had promised to, uh, have so far promised to kind of enact as, as we move forward. So there are a couple of questions here about uh, the impact and what can change, what might change. Um, David Clarkin, a couple of other people, Eric Talbot have asked that question. So uh, Eric's question was, what are the chances that this exposure of betrayal will bring about positive, substantial, and lasting change uh, at CPS. David, maybe you could talk a little bit about what's been promised and, and maybe what, what it has yet to happen. In, in broad outlines, <clears throat> there have been a series, of really a raft of uh, legislative proposals and bills that have been introduced in the General Assembly. And then during the three weeks that Johnny just talked about when we'd given our data and our findings to CPS, CPS began to formulate a, a, a very sort of top to bottom review of their child protection processes. They brought in former uh, State Inspector General Maggie Hickey to do an analysis for them and that's still not yet published. But they also restructured the way they handle these cases within CPS. And I must say for us, this is now created kind of a pivot in our work where yes, we're still investigating, we're still looking at cases, but we are also very closely watching to see if these very forceful, powerful, swift changes are in fact going to do good for the young people in our schools. So let me dive in here on a question that in some ways, I guess, puts our feet to the fire, so I'll ask it. 
Um, the staff in question in the story almost were all members of the Chicago Teachers Union, and thus they were defended by the union. Um, the CTO is largely absent from the story. The question is why, but maybe if anybody wants to take that question or at least explain at least what we know about the CTU and, and the role it plays. Well, we certainly also confronted the CTU with uh, our conclusions as well. It was another very lengthy meeting with uh, one of their attorneys, uh, one of some of their top officials in which we kind of laid everything out and explained what it was that was coming. Um, I'll also add that, yes, while there are a lot of Chicago Teachers Union members who have invo been involved in these cases, it's not just the CTU. It's not just the CTU. There are other staff members uh, who aren't necessarily represented by the Chicago Teachers Union, who are represented by other labor groups, uh, who are also involved in these sorts of cases. I think I, one of the things, one of the points that I would emphasize is that, you know, the, the perpetrators who are involved in these incidents, at least from an adult on student perspective, the staff members who are involved in abusing or harassing or en engaging in this kind of sexual misconduct against students, uh, it's not necessarily limited to one labor group, and it's certainly not necessarily limited to one type of school, what be it a you know, selective enrollment school, when some of the you know, absolute top, most high-performing high schools in the district, or you know, some of a struggling elementary school. It's not limited. It's, it's, it's incredibly, it's pervasive. It's pervasive, and it's systemic, and it's not necessarily limited to just one labor group. We have a question here um, from Antoinette Taylor. Uh, I'm gonna try and answer this one because it'll probably be a, kind of a short answer, but I do wanna get to it. The news reported that some of the children impacted were students with a disability. Uh, can or will the Tribune confirm this? Yes, uh, that we did find uh, children with disabilities being targeted. We are writing a story that will expand on that finding that you'll see very soon, we hope. Um, question for uh, to get back to the reporting process, um, Gary, you also had the other uh, role of trying to track down some of the people alleged, the alleged perpetrators, knocking on those doors, going to Florida uh, for in one case. Tell us about that experience and how you handle that type of interview, which has its own set of issues. Yeah, that's well, that's a you know that's a very nerve-wracking but very important process. I mean, obviously. Uh, when you're writing about anybody in a negative way, you want the counter narrative. You really want their part, uh, their viewpoint in the story. Um, you know, some people think that, you know, just having, you know, laying out these problems is enough, but it really isn't. The stories are much better when you have a counter narrative, when you have uh, the individuals who you're targeting really explaining to you, uh, providing you with context and perspective about what they may or may not have done, even their denial is very, very important. Um, so the reporting process uh, involved in trying to find these alleged perpetrators, um, you know, it's, it's really, we, we, you know, we would send, you sent letters to them, we would call them on the telephone, um, we, would, we would knock on their doors, and in many cases this went on for many months, and in, in several cases we just didn't hear anything back. So then it was my responsibility to sort of go and try to to find these individuals, and um, uh, one of the individuals was uh, Steven Stepanian, and he was a former teacher at uh, Montefiore, and he had been accused of, um, uh, you know, some sexual, serious sexual misconduct in Montefiore, and he had since left the district quietly, and this is uh, one of the instances where we went down to Florida, and despite his uh, misconduct and despite being, um, being allowed to leave quietly, he ended up teaching down in Florida, so, I, uh, I found him down there, and it's the kind of thing where you, you book a three-day vacation. You do not a vacation. You book a <laughs> Sorry about that. I wish it was a three-day vacation. I need, yeah, I yeah, need I one, George. I need one. <laughs> We've been working really hard. I'm this, thinking this Florida will be edited, vacation. This will be edited for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hear there's some perpetrators in Helsinki. Exactly. <laughs> so... Um, you know, so I, we, I went down with Brian Casellas, who's a photographer, and we had basically, we had 10 addresses. And we didn't know where this, we didn't really know where he was. We had sent him certified letters, no response. We had called his phone number, no response. And so, you know, I think I told George we're gonna be there four days. And the odds are, when you land, you're not gonna find this person. It's not like he had a solid address. We knew where he was gonna be, um, and so, uh, Brian and I, you know, we land in Tampa and we get a, we get a rent a car and we just p sort of pick the first address. 
and it's you know we go over the causeway we're driving along and then we you know make a right turn into this mobile home park and um, then we make another right turn and then we're passing these mobile homes and I had a very very um, uh, bad reproduction of his Florida driver's license which had been taken maybe 10 years before and so we're driving very slowly and I see somebody standing outside a mobile home and I said to Brian I think that's him <laughs> and um, so we sort of parked the car a little bit you know beyond his mobile home and then he some, you know, and then we get out and we start walking towards him and um, you know, he's standing there and I say, hey, I'm Gary Marks from the Chicago Tribune. You know, I'd like to speak to you for a few minutes. And he does not reach my, does not shake my hand and he, uh, he says, I'm not gonna talk to you. I'm not talking to you. And I said, well, have you received our letter? Yes, I did. You know, have you received our phone calls? Yes, I did, but I'm not talking to you. You wasted your time coming down here. And then I sort of begin, you know, my, well, listen, you know, can you just listen to what we have to say, what we're writing about? Um, you know, no, I'm not going to talk to you, but, you know, we flew down here. And you sort of, you know, massage. You just want to keep the conversation going. And eventually says, um, I'll talk to you, but I want to have this individual who's my friend of mine with me. I said, sure, call him up. And so, you know, we end up sitting outside on his, uh, behind his mobile home in a nice little patio, and we spoke for... Um, two or three hours, and um, he answered all of our questions, and um, he decided to be photographed and, and uh, actually do a short video as well, and so, you know, that's how you go about doing it. You know, you really sort of ex you tell them, you know, listen, this is what we have. These are the documents we have. They allege that you did this, this, and this, but documents don't tell all the story. We want to hear what you have to say about this. Put these records into perspective. Tell us your perspective. And this only makes the story stronger. And some people will talk to you and others don't. And in this case, we were very fortunate that Mr. Stepanian did talk to us because I think it made the story much stronger. So there are a couple of questions here that I think get at the issue of scope. Um, one is about whether uh, with these individuals, whether uh, who were alleged perpetrators, how many quote unquote victims they may have had, would we know? And then also the question of, as we tried to put a number on the number of cases and the number of victims, uh, how do we feel about what percentage or what, uh, how many more there might be? Jennifer, if you could sort of address what we know and what we don't know about the scope of the problem. We, there is admittedly a lot we, we don't know. Uh, what we do know is that there are more than 500 cases dating back 10 years in which a child reported uh, to Chicago police and they agreed that a crime had occurred, um, either sexual abuse or sexual assault. We don't know exactly of that group how many times the perpetrator was an educator, a school employee, or another student. Um, our sense in reporting out dozens and dozens and dozens of these cases is that it is, it is more common that a uh, school employee was the perpetrator. Um, but we can't say for sure. So we have that universe of more than 500 cases where we know children were harmed. Um, and we have the district saying back to 2011, which is a shorter time frame, there were 430 cases that were adult on student. So just sort of, you know, we can line those up and, and, and get a good sense that a large percentage of those cases that were reported to police um, were in fact adult perpetrators. There are also questions about um, could we do this type of reporting for other institutions beyond Chicago, um, parochial, private charter schools, suburban schools, elsewhere in the state, other institutions. Um, I think we all would agree that CPS is probably not the only place that has this type of problem. Um, but is there something about the way that um, CPS, which gives a lot of control to principals, uh, which is this vast, at times unwieldy network, it, that the, the nature of CPS itself um, contributed to this, Johnny? I, I think there, I think there's kind of two. I think there there may be two, at least two factors at play here, and, and one of them certainly is that, I mean. 
let's, let's keep in mind that despite a very dramatic enrollment decline, the Chicago Public Schools is still a massive unit of government and an enormous bureaucracy that serves hundreds of thousands of students, many of them who are black, brown, and poor. And it's easy to see or, or imagine a situation where someone might argue that the sorts of incidents that we're talking about are just sort of kind of the cost of doing business when you're dealing with such a massive system and when you're dealing with a series of crises that oftentimes seem to present their own type of existential threat to the very business of educating these kids, right? I can understand how that perspective might be held by some folks. At the same time, though, um, there is still certainly, there, there, are, uh, there are quantifiable operational shortfalls that have happened here throughout this entire process. The district has acknowledged to us its problems with background checks. The district has acknowledged to us the fact that it does not track, or at least it did not track these sorts of cases in any kind of consistent or formal manner. The district acknowledged to us that its investigative process fell short when it comes to supporting the victims who have often been, who have, who have been victims of trauma. Um, and there is certainly a case to be made for the fact that uh, a lack of transparency has certainly played a role in obstructing the public's ability to understand the very scope of this situation. Um, one of those reforms that has been promised would hand over um, the responsibility for investigating uh, adult on student cases to the school system's inspector general. And as part of that process, there's promises at least for some kind of new levels of sort of out reporting, uh, summary statistics, some, some, some degree of quantification for how frequently this happens. Uh, that strikes me as certainly one significant reform here. Um, but again, you know, there are still shortfalls within state law, within the Personnel Records Review Act, for example, that the district has cited, uh, shortfalls in the Freedom of Information Act that are um, potentially on their way to being resolved uh, if the legislature is able to get this done. Um, so yeah, is, is it a big bureaucracy where problems can potentially fall through the cracks? Perhaps. But for me, it strains the imagination to think that this district, especially as risk averse as it has become in recent years, uh, that no one was watching this series of news reports, you know, either on television or in the newspaper or online, and that no one thought to themselves, well, how big is this problem and, and where might our own weaknesses be? There's a question I'd like to direct to uh, David um, from, I believe I have this right, Mayra Flores, Office of Protection of Children and Youth. Um, there were 520 investigations. How many convictions resulted in a person being precluded from future employment in other schools. And also, uh, they're asking about victim outreach um, and compliance in the future for volunteers. I imagine that has to do with, with the reporting requirement to call DCFS. We closely examined, out of those 523 reports, uh, 108 in great detail. And that's because of the um, strict and, I guess, um, righteous pr uh, privacy protections that surround juvenile school and court and medical records. We were not able to get details in the others. Out of those 108, uh, roughly 72 resulted in adult uh, criminal charges against adults. And I don't want to misspeak, but I, it was probably a half a dozen or so cases where there was an acquittal or a, or a finding that they uh, child had invented the whole thing or somehow the adult was exonerated. So only a small portion of those cases that actually go to that uh, level um, uh, didn't result in a finding of the abuse having happened. But again, I want to underscore um, what Jennifer said, that this whole field, um, as with sexual assault in general, but certainly child sex abuse, um, as you folks who are specialists know, is these cases are vastly un underreported. And uh, when there have been surveys done where students merely answer a questionnaire, uh, uh, you would expect many, many more cases based on that. Finally, briefly to the last part of the question, how were students supported or how is that going to change? What, one of the reasons we wrote this series was because of our anguish and outrage about how um, little students were supported in the instances where we uh, were able to get records. And in fact, in some cases, students were 
ostracized, were bullied, were subjected to uh, repeated rounds of questions that, that only further uh, deepened the humiliation and, and the hurt that they experienced. And I think that um, CEO Janice Jackson has really made that more than anything uh, her mission in this turnaround plan. Her, as she's put it, we have to, for the first time, start putting the students first. You know, in some ways I was thinking as you were speaking of um, Kiana Aguilar and her experience at Hubbard High School. And um, one of the things that struck me as we, as we worked on these stories and prepared them for print was there were these cases where there were just such profiles and courage. And they were the, oftentimes the courage were, where you found it was with the victims. And Kiana certainly in that case uh, step forward with uh, certainly support of her family. Jennifer, you dealt with Kiana. Could you tell people a little bit about Kiana's story and how you, how you found her and how you came to write about her? So Kiana, she's in college now, so she's no longer in a CPS school, um, was a student at Hubbard High School, um, was a very successful student, was active in JROTC, was an athlete, made good grades, and she encountered a security guard there named Walter Wells, um, who would ask her for hugs. And instead of just giving her a hug, he would, he would grope her. Uh, this happened to her, her twice um, when she was a junior at school. Uh, Kiana did find the courage to come forward at school and tell someone this had happened. By the time she did that, and investigations began, and the police began looking at the matter, um, it was found that there had been several victims of the security guard even before Kiana. But Kiana became, um, both at Hubbard and in court, and then again in the Betrayed series, a very clear voice who came forward and said, this is not okay. We should not have to, to deal with this at school. Um, and and she, you know, she is a, an incredibly brave young woman um, who was able to look at us and look at the camera um, and speak to you and tell, tell you exactly what had happened to her and how it harmed her. Um, she, she very clearly articulated you know, how, how much grief it brought her, this violation at school, um, and how it still affects her to this day. There's a question here uh, relating to one of the cases we chose, how we found that girl and why we chose her um, in general, maybe one of you, maybe David could speak to our process for trying to find the victims. And sure, we uh, would comb through the records and, and again we're looking at police reports, at school reports, sometimes uh, lawsuits and uh, uh, we would also do a lot of street work and interviews and um, when we thought we had the um, identity of the victim then the the process started that Gary describes, uh, a process of, of seeking out uh, consent in the most open-ended uh, way. And uh, it's really, uh, again, the, um, I'm, I'm just very proud of the Tribune's long tradition of complete transparency in these type of investigative reports. I think I'm getting the signal here. One more, all right, so um, Johnny, I was wondering, um, as somebody who understands the connection uh, between CPS and City Hall, um, what do you, do you expect this to be an issue? Uh, has it become an issue already in the race? And will the mayor, what has the mayor said? And do you expect him to, to say more or do more? This, this is a tough one um, because I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know yet. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> confident. I'm confident that this reporting has has certainly altered the tenor of the election. It's just a question of of how dramatically that's occurred, um, and it's also a question of you, you've seen the district push incredibly aggressively to try to get out in front of this by launching a number of the reforms that uh, Maggie Hickey has already suggested to the district and many of which that uh, the, C the CEO certainly promoted here uh, in this forum uh, just uh, last week or a couple weeks ago. You can see how the school system is trying to, to push hard to, to implement a lot of these reforms. Um, and so 
you know, the election is just around the corner, but it's also really far away in the eyes of, of some voters. You know, does that make sense? You know, so, so how, how hard will this resonate? I, I guess I'm not entirely clear about that. You've certainly seen the mayor um, issue a sort of apology um, when he's talking about how the, the district has responded to this. But uh, in another incident uh, just recently here when he was asked a question about, uh, about, his res about this issue, um, you know, Janice Jackson was there on the stage with him and you saw him immediately cede the microphone and bring her in to talk about what the district has, has done so far to ensure that students are safe. Um, I think that was a, I think that that's a moment that kind of illustrates how the city administration is, is going to be looking at handling this issue going forward. You know, I think one of the uh, unique dynamics we saw with this investigation, even, even though we've all been involved with many of these types of investigations, is that other media throughout Chicago really jumped on this story and wrote about it. So when the mayor kind of apologized, it was a page one story for the, for the Chicago Sun-Times. Um, you know, radio, TV, uh, like I said, the Sun-Times, a lot of people are, took note of what we reported about, amplified it, and I think they, my guess is that could help keep it alive as an issue as we move forward. So actually, I'm told we have one final, final question, which I think is kind of important uh, in that it gets at, will things change? Um, there, one of the issues we brought up was having a unit that can investigate these cases that is not compromised, that can look at them objectively. Where do we stand, uh, this is a question from Warren Simmons, on getting a separate investigative process? We um, pointed out in our series, not that the CPS investigative process was flawed once it was turned over to the investigative unit. They actually uh, did a, a thorough job of the cases we looked at. The flaw came in the fact that that unit was housed in the CPS law department, and the law department then used those investigative files, um, in some cases, to attack the young people when they sought compensation in the courts, and that created what many national experts called a um, an obvious conflict of interest. What CPS did was move the entire process, and they're moving it into the Inspector General's uh, office, which is a model that's akin to New York City's, and that process is happening now. Um, it's unclear, again, is that going to be better for the protection of young people or not? That's something we really are, um, again, pivoting from investigating to holding accountable and trying to understand uh, because you have to train up a new staff, you have to um, uh, 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 really um, get institutional knowledge and historical knowledge in the hands of those inspector general investigators and that seems to me to be a, a daunting challenge. Okay, we'd like to um, thank our moderator, thank all of our panelists. Let's give them a big thank you.